you know the movie The Thing? I, I do know the movie The Thing, yeah. I know of it. One of my favouritest horror movies. Like, of all, possibly... Oh, mate, it might be 50-50 with Event Horizon. Maybe. But... It's, it's up there. It's, like, usually number one. Because it's so fucking good. And there has never been a body horror that comes close. No, Void did not come close. Now, I've been thinking about the thing. Do you a rewatch anyway? But Pinball M came out. Look at that. I mentioned a video game within like the first two minutes. Yeah. And there's a thing that I think Pinball Table in it, which I will talk about Pinball M in it, like when we talk about such things. But I was playing Pinball the Thing, the table, and the question entered my head which of the things from the movie The Thing? If you had to fuck one, <laughs> would it be? There are several I mean, things. If you need time to Google the different things, I mean, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I am I am yeah. googling. I don't remember the things in the thing. Mm-hmm. The dog thing, I I believe, would be the most sort of iconic. Right, but nobody's thing. going to immediately pipe up and say the dog thing. I mean, it's got tentacles. The two that I always remember is the dog thing or the um, upside down head with the spider legs. I could work with that. Yeah? Yeah, I could work with that. Push comes to shove. I mean, his eyes are out of the way. Right, yeah. Uh, We've also got, uh, what's it, the Blair thing, which is the big stop motion mess at the end with um, what's his face, his face. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. That's the one that I was about to bring up. I I could make that work. Yeah? Nice. Yeah, I can make it work. There's enough humanoid aspects going on, I can make it work. Yeah, but I feel like there's just way too much going on with that. Like, I mean, I'm a I'm a very giving partner. Like, where am I supposed to touch to satisfy? On the spider head thing, I sort of figure that, you know, your options are pretty limited. You'll find it. Well, I mean, look, I I think with with the Blair thing, you start with, like, the closest approximations and, like, go go with the vibe of, are you responding well? Well, all I have to say is that this was the perfect conversation to have on the week where I can't jack off. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh... There's a funny (laughs) aspect to that. Well, not to that. Um... (laughs) I mean, there is. <laughs> but it did only dawn on me today that you'd had like something done because you know uh-huh. me and my attention, like it, it doesn't retain information. So when you said to me that you had a wicked cool like surgery scar, well not cool, uh-huh. but like a wicked surgery scar, and then started asking me like like whether or not Jonathan should inspect uh, scabs. Mm-hmm. I immediately filed the surgery bit away as irrelevant information because you'd <laughs> said Jonathan. And right. I and I just glossed over it as I do many things. Well, we'd actually had a conversation a couple of days earlier where I mentioned I had to get off my swollen testes and you just breezed just, right past it. <laughs> I I I just Took that as normal. I was just <laughs> hmm, swollen testes. Nice reference to testes if you're gonna reference them. And then I moved on with the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean my my balls are fine. Um, went and got my vasectomy Friday morning. It's funny, like they gave me uh Ativan as a you know like mm. a pre uh surgery for anxiety thing. And it was one of those things where I commented, like, I'm not really sure this is having any effect. Like, but I was calm throughout the procedure. And then as soon as I got home, I sat uh, down for a moment and just passed out, just <laughs> completely fell unconscious. And and I, I thought, oh, well, then maybe it just didn't kick in until after I was done. It was a delayed reaction. But then I realized that on thinking back on the experience... Of having a man shoot my testicle sac with a laser and then dig around to find uh, a couple of tubes, sever them, and tie them off with his fingers 
uh, before stitching my ball sack closed at, at no point other than when they were injecting the lidocaine. And that's just my needle thing going batshit. Did I ever feel any sort of squickiness? It was only on reflection back thinking about it and even thinking about it now. I can feel my testicles shriveling back up <laughs> into my body with the discomfort of the idea of having needles poked into my balls. But in the moment, Ugh. fine. Totally fine. It's So it, it's not that it didn't do anything. It's that it... You know, it it kept you at a baseline of normal yeah, when you should like have it. been at chaos. Right? Yeah, yeah. It 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 must have done something. Um, but I'm 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 well on the mend. The scab is fantastic. Like yeah. as a as a scab fan, like <laughs> this one is truly <laughs> truly remarkable. I I love a scab when I get one, but you know most areas of skin are relatively taut. You know, oh. <laughs> this is just a huh. lot of loose flesh and it seems to recover, heal quickly because there's a, a capillary action there. So it's just immediately, apart from the like main stitch point, within like two days started peeling up. Fucking hell. And so now I got, just got loose flaps of sky. That's... Listeners, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is me saying this, so... <laughs> You know it's warranted. You know, I was wondering how much of this I really should have saved for Boston's favourite son. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We'll uh, we'll be bringing that back. Um, he needs to hear it. I wouldn't apologise for it there. Um, <laughs> fucking hell. Yeah. Well, but... I'm, I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, no, I'm fine. And, and, and really, I mean, I, I, I'm laughing about it and making jokes about it in, in part because it really has not been a big deal at all. Like mm -hmm. it, it was very simple. I had a couple of days where I didn't do much, and that was mostly just because I didn't want to, you know, put any risk to my balls. But I was back to light work within a couple of days. Coco, and because I think that there are probably uh, some middle age or approaching men in our audience still, a few. <laughs> and if you are done having children or if you think that you do not want to have children and and you know uh you can get access to it and that's a big hurdle because a lot of insurance carriers don't cover it but if it's available to you i would seriously give some consideration to doing it because it's not just about me not spraying my seed everywhere anymore, although that is good and fine and well. But it also means that my partner no longer uh, will need to take some form of birth control. If you know you're not going to have kids and this represents an available option to you, take the you know step to do that and don't put that responsibility on somebody else um hmm. is is where i'm i'm coming at from that it's it's safe it's quick you recover easily and in most cases it is reversible if that should come up uh there's it, it, i i'm i'm really evangelizing a bit for for people to give some yeah. thought to getting this procedure because there are benefits in a lot of places that you might not consider Oh. So but this is this has been a fascinating episode of Conrad's Testicle Corner. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Conrad's <laughs> Testy Corner. <laughs> so oh. anyway, um, did we play video games? Yeah. Oh, can I just quickly say, please, I better front load it that I've recovered from my own injuries from last week. Oh, good. Which is good because uh, on December 17th in Blackpool, <laughs> yes. um, that is Saturday, December 17th in Blackpool, um, Spectrum Wrestling is back. Uh, we have a new show, Happy Returns. Uh, the match, uh, the main event, 
we announced was myself and Priscilla, Queens of the Space Age, versus the landed gentry, Xeonox and Benji. Oh. Uh, Xeonox, of course, will be familiar, not just to Spectrum folks, but, you know, anyone who saw my uh, early UK wrestling career. Xeonox was my first ever sort of nemesis. So, yeah, Benji and Zeo, pair of Tory wankers going up against Queens of the Space Age. Should be very good. We've got lots of other um, matches. Uh, folks like... Um, Amir Jordan, uh, Sam Gradwell, like NXT guys, uh, former NXT guys, um, uh, like coming in, and we got the Freak Show, of course, the clowns, uh, and <laughs> new characters as well. So yeah, um, you can get tickets for that at buytickets dot at slash pcw uh because we are doing this um in, in somewhat of a, an association with pcw because they have a show in that venue same day later that day so you know why not make it a double bill um but yes buy tickets dot at slash pcw that's for uh spectrum wrestling happy returns in blackpool on december 17th thank you nice there we go uh yeah so we we should probably talk about some games mm-hmm. yeah, I, th- I think i think i'm the one who's played the most things this week but i can talk about one that steph started playing as well right. that i have finished playing should we talk about in stars and time a bit more sure yeah so yeah so i brought this game up last week and i'd played maybe like five or six hours out of it at the time and i was very impressed with with it, it, it for anyone who didn't listen to last week's it is a time loop RPG set in a very limited amount of time before the like before the world ends, uh, like the town before the big bad castle and like a three floor dungeon, and I have finished that game now, and I this is one of my favorite games in in years that I have to give a really big caveat because I know it is going to infuriate some people. Yes. And I think it is important to talk about that as much as I might give it a pass for me personally. Some people are just going to hate this game. Um, Yeah. And I think the big thing to say is when I talked about this last week, I had played the opening hours and a lot of my praise for the game was how well good of a job it did in terms of not being repetitive in that time loop. And I think there are big stretches of this game where that that does apply, and I would say that is correct. There is definitely a section of this game in the middle that is repetitive, and your tolerance for that is going to be different depending on who you are. And I think I have to get into a bit of a, a side discussion here about this, which is I am not usually someone willing to be forgiving of a game design element that is bad in the moment but is used to justify something later. I usually am not a big fan of that. And I, in this case, think that it will put a lot of people off of this piece of media. I'm not saying that it is a good choice that was made that will make this a piece of media that I can easily recommend. But, with that caveat said, having finished this game, I think it incredibly well sticks the landing and does a phenomenally good job of justifying the choices it makes about repetition and length. And I say that with the understanding of anyone who gets to the bit where it's a bit repetitive for a while and it does not enjoy that. Or anyone who hears it, it get it gets a bit repetitive in the middle for reasons later and goes, that pisses me off. I'm not going to be able to change your opinion about this game. That being said, I maintain my point. Having finished it, I think this is one of the best games I have played in years. Um, it is going to stick with me for an incredibly long time. And I think that in this one case... There is an argument to be made that it would not have been as effective if not for the fact that it made you get stuck in this loop past the point where it was fun, past the point where it was novel, for a bit of time. There is a degree of, I am stuck in the mundanity of this loop, not getting, not, not get, making progress as excitingly as I once was. And... Anyone who dislikes that, I do not blame you at all. This game is not for everyone, but if you have a tolerance for repetition, 
I think this game is fucking fantastic. Yep. Yeah. What? 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 What do you reckon? You've been You've been playing some of this. I have. So, uh, I can't tell you how long I've played it because it's one of those games mm. that doesn't pause the timer, even if you put it to sleep. Even if the switch is like asleep. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, the only other game I've seen do that is uh, the Switch port of Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, that mm. has done the same thing. Um, so, according to the game, I have been playing for a, like well over uh, two hundred and thirty hours. <laughs> um, but I think I am at that middle portion uh, that you yeah. referenced because like... I ended up. Sometimes it makes you guess the right way, and if you, yeah, yeah, and if you fail the guessing game, you've got to do like a whole bit of gameplay again. Um, like it's, it's a, it's an interesting variant on the concept of backtracking, where you're yeah. going the same direction through the same area. Forward tracking, I don't know, but mm. it's, it is an excellent game conceptually it's it's writing is fantastic narratively uh in terms of all of the writing the script is pitch perfect a lot of the Mm. time um i was stunned by the sheer level of of uh queer representation in it and and i i'll throw in i was really impressed at how how good of a job they did of building the queer representation into the wider world building. Yeah, like it's um, it's very much baked into the law because yeah. the whole the culture of the country you're in, they believe in change as a god. So yeah, change change as religious belief and the power of change leads to some really interesting. Like the the one I will talk about that I think is a really nice example is. There is a conversation separately had about the reason that people in this country have multiple names. And it's then very casually, like, that. here's the religious significance of it. Oh, and sometimes when people change genders, they have a name ready to go somewhere in that list of names. And, like, that's just, like, a nice way to onboard to a bit of here's our world's queer queer identity. Yeah, that was actually the uh, scene I was going to bring up as well. Um, I apologize for no, jumping on. No, 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 that, you know, that just, I think that speaks to um, the effectiveness of that scene, that it sticks out that mm. much. I was talking to Fee about it, and that was the bit I mentioned, because it is a great example. Um, and I just love, like, typically they get three. You get a mask one, a femme one, and then just one for good measure. Yeah. And then they mention a friend of theirs that has ten, just because that's the culture it they have where just constantly adapting and evolving who you are is a huge is it's like a fundamental belief um yeah and, and like you say leads to a lot of um queer rap and it's, that's yeah and like while that's the first big one that sticks in my mind there are other ones that you may not have come like i think i know roughly where you are there's a couple you won't have come across yet that continue they don't just settle for one good idea they they have a bunch of really interesting ideas of like here's the core idea of our world here's how that interacts with queerness yeah yeah i love that there's a scene about like inquiring about characters pronouns yeah i like the variety of rep like it's you've got in the party a they them and a he they like even among like non-binary rep you don't see a lot of he they like you will see some she they and obviously a lot of of they them but you rarely see he they pronouns in media which i like i enjoyed that what one of the like the only other times i can think of that a video game had multiple different kinds of non-binary representation with multiple different sets of pronouns i think was ickenfell yes and i think this deserves to be in similar conversations in terms of how it handles some of its queer rep really well. Yeah. I think there is definitely some some similarities to be drawn. Indeed. And I I don't know if more will become apparent. Like, I know you, you've mentioned mm. more sort of... Um, more discussions along those lines are in the game. But I don't know if, if, like, concepts behind it evolve, but it seems really clear that the game itself, like, entirely is about transition as well as anything else. I think there is definitely a very strong, consistent reading through that game of 
transition as change, and like, while that might not be the plot, it is definitely a plot that is is very, very central to what that game does. Also, I love Bonnie. Oh, your little not not quite party member. Yeah, you yeah. get uh Bonnie who is not officially a controllable member of the party, but they will randomly like sometimes attack or you can give them a skill. Yeah, they can heal, do all sorts of little little bits of chiming in. Yeah. What I love about the presentation of one of the things they can do is if an enemy is like one hit away from death, sometimes Bonnie will hit them. Uh, just to, because, you know, you don't want to sit there waiting for another turn just to win a one fight. So I like that they have that option of Bonnie will just smack them if, if they're that close to death. And I loved the presentation when they introduced that mechanic of letting the little kid get the last hit and them all celebrating yeah. that they did it like you do with kids. You let them do the last little bit and then congratulate them for doing it. It's the... I'm not gonna put you on the front lines where you could get seriously hurt, but like, oh yeah, that enemy is about to fall over. Uh, smack him around the head. Go yep. on, go on, you got him. Like letting your kid do the last bit of icing on a cake. Like, it's yeah. it's such a cute thing. Um, and that's, you know, the game is is very cute. Like, the characters are super endearing. I love um, Loop, the character with the star head, which is just a great fashion choice star for a face. Yeah, Loop is fascinating uh their whole involvement in the plot is is super interesting yeah i i i love it i really like it my one issue would be a little bit of the character art not all of it like it's got this kind of sketch like look that is nice and i enjoy a lot of the way the characters look it's mostly the they drew a bit of uh, the main character's fringe over uh, a bit of the eye, but kept the full eye under the hair. So... Oh, that old anime chestnut, yeah. Yeah, and, and it it just looks so wrong to me. It's a style choice, and it's a style choice that annoys a lot of people. Yeah. And it, you either love it or you hate it. Because it looks like a mistake. It looks like they forgot to erase a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I just keep looking at it, and it's it just looks strange to me. I like some of the character art. It's hit and miss, but but in uh, that one in particular is just a bit... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but otherwise, yeah, I've got less mileage in me for the caveat you mentioned. Um, yeah, and that is totally understandable. Yeah, I got through a bit where through... Losing a guessing game twice, I had to go through the same floor three times and then start the entire loop from the beginning again. And that's where I've stopped. And it wasn't like out of in a grumpy way. It was just like, okay, I'm going to take a break from this. But now where I remember what I've done and where I am, I've struggled to execute on picking it back up. I would honestly say... If if you if you have that moment, just fucking look up a video walkthrough and just let it point you where you need to go. I think that there is considerable merit in playing the ending of this rather than watching it. And in playing through it, even if you go, I don't want to have to do more repetition than is necessary, I will follow something pointing me what is the correct way and what it... like oh, I've been told to look for a thing and it could be in one of multiple locations, which one's it in? If you can let yourself have that uh, that that bit of uh, of assist, because, like, my god, the last four or five hours of, of this game, I could not put it down. Um, there was a period of a couple of nights, like, toward the end of me playing this, where every night I would come to bed uh, and be like, okay, Jane, I have to tell you the new things that are happening in this, because, oh my god, what the fuck is it? Like, it... It is very impressive, and it does a lot with what it's doing, but I don't blame anyone who gets lost in the middle. It, 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 is, not, it is not an easily recommendable, everyone will think this is game of the year. It's a, there is a game of the year with a hurdle you have to kind of get through if, it's, if it annoys you. Yeah, and I want to play it through. I am 
worried that I am just going to ADHD away and like drift away from it because I do have like yeah. other stuff I've got to move on to. Um, I would like to get back into it though because I, I do love so much about it. But we'll see. I think I will probably end up doing the guide route if I pick it up again. Yeah, just because I'm, I don't want to tread water. Like I want to enjoy that script and advance the story. If you are going to do the the narrative has it slow down. If there's an example that justifies it, it's this. But that doesn't change the fact that in the moment it's not giving you the thing you want from the game and that has been the appeal of the game up to that point. Yeah. And that is a really... It's a big ask. Mm-hmm. So yeah, in Stars and Time, it's a game that is very definitely going to be in my Game of the Year consideration while also being a game that like I can't talk about it without getting into the big <laughs> caveat, and that is a weird situation to be in with a game. Yeah. And I always look at those games as a testament to the quality of the really good parts, that you are able to power through something you'd otherwise have no patience for. Yeah, and I think that's sort of where I landed on this, is I'd have been more critical right until I got to the end and went, that was so good. The time where I was having a mediocre time that I don't care about anymore. And it doesn't change the fact it wasn't great at the time, but yeah... Uh, so yeah, that's that's in Stars and Time. Uh, Conrad, what have, what have you been playing this week? Um, well, I I did play a tiny bit of Steam World Build. Um, which oh, yeah, I, Jane was telling me about this. Yeah, thing. it's on Game Pass, and when I say I played a little bit of it, I played a very little bit of it. I think it's probably pretty good, but I'm not in the headspace for that kind of like town building mechanic mm. system so I, I just sort of bounced off it right away but the thing that i've been playing a more considerable bit of is called while the iron's hot this also mm -hmm. just popped up on game pass it's a blacksmith game Ooh, yeah you have a dream of becoming a master blacksmith like the people at this distant island so you board a ship uh, to travel there and something goes wrong on the ship and you wind up washed ashore there to discover that all of the blacksmiths are gone and there's just one dude there and he's like hey we can rebuild blacksmithing and so that's what you do one of the things i think is really interesting about this game is that it puts in a lot of the kind of limiting mechanics that you see in crafting games like Smelting ore, that takes time. So you have to put the ore into your forge and wait for it to come out as ingots. But there is a lever that you can pull on and do a little timing mini game where you pull the trigger in a range and that will speed the process up. Right at the outset, we're introducing a, a limiting mechanic and then a manner of circumventing or softening that. And that's something that seems to be persisting through a lot of these uh, sorts of mechanics. You have a stamina bar, which actually seems like it's a lot longer than it really is. It depletes over time. It depletes after certain actions. And one of the big ones that it depletes from is traveling across the world map. The game is presented in two perspectives, a 2D uh, flat plane where you can walk back and forth and do some light climbing up and down things. You also get a like a dodge roll maneuver that lets you cross gaps, but there's no combat in this. It's just a roll for navigation. And then this world map, which is a top view that lets you travel between these towns and locations that have these 2D plane scenes in them. And traveling that world map, every step that you take depletes your meter, and it's a real drag. And you can start to see how as the world map opens up and you can access more places, it would start to be a real hindrance. And you'll gain levels in between days that will, you know, increase, you can increase the amount of energy that you get. There are ways to mitigate that. But 
just at the point where the game would open up the world map to you in a really broad place where there's a lot of exploration to do, you immediately get access to a cart and mobile forge that allows you to travel at no cost to energy and set up shop to make stuff anywhere you are so you don't have to go all the way back to your origin point to do it. It is immediately removing some of those limiting factors that would normally slow a game like this down intentionally in favor of uh, ease of play, which I really like. Visually, it's it's interesting. It's got that kind of lanky character design that you sometimes see in sprite art where they're the characters are a bit tall and so the the limbs seem cartoonishly long it works sometimes i think it works in this that's fun there's clearly a a mystery going on as to why the blacksmiths disappeared that's intriguing and i'm looking forward to exploring more um you meet an ox friend who becomes your ox friend like right immediately and is adorable and you can give him gifts to wear. I gave him a straw hat and now he's walking around wearing a straw hat with a piece of straw hanging out of his mouth. It's adorable. It's a very charming game, but everything is uh sort of the, 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 the heart of it is getting orders to make things and then making things at, at your forge using your tools. And it's a multi-step process to create things. You have to get the ingots from the ore and you can just buy ingots and you'll find a lot of ingots. So it doesn't make you do this a ton, it seems, but if you run out of resources available, it, you'll have to make some. And then once you have your ingots, you go to your anvil and you can pound them out into a variety of different shapes. Uh, they are plates that can be one by one, one by two, two by two. They can be curved. And each of these correspond to different items that you can then build on your crafting table later. Once you've selected what you want to hammer out on your anvil, it goes to a little mini game where a cursor moves back and forth across a field and you are presented with the shape that the object is supposed to be and then there are bits of metal that are extending off the edges of that that need to be hammered out so that you are finished with the shape that you want and so the targeting reticule moves back and forth to uh, right to left you can control the up and down of where it is and then you pull the trigger where it's over a place that you want to hit more complex metals later on move faster so it does get more difficult to play but you don't fail if you don't successfully knock off all of the bits, you have a limited number of strikes that you can use. But it's not a failure. You just wind up with a lower quality product when you uh, come out the other side. Then you have a sharpening stone because some of the items will need to have sharp metal. Others will not. And that just adds another layer to the number of recipes that you can build when you get to the crafting table, which presents a three by three grid that you can place objects on. And then once you've placed all of the objects in a configuration that would match a recipe, you hold the X button and it will put them together and make your object. But that does mean you can experiment in this place also. Some of the items that you will find in the world, you might not find recipes for, but they are similar to other things you already know how to make. And so you can experiment with ways to, like for example, I learned early on how to make an axe, but I saw hatchets out in the world. And I found a point at which I would need a hatchet to, to accomplish something, but I didn't know how it was made, and I didn't have a place where I could just buy one. But because I knew that the axe used a sharpened 2x2 two two piece of metal, I deduced that a hatchet would only require a 1.1 and one less piece of wood, and so I reasoned out how to make one, and did. So that's really neat. It very quickly upgrades your forge so that you can produce multiple items at the same time in mass. And that's, you know, from, at every point in the process, you can hammer out multiple items on the anvil only playing one minigame. You can sharpen multiple bits of metal 
in the sharpening mini game, which is again a uh, this is a Simon repeat the action I just did within a time limit thing. You have the four directional cross of the D pad, and you just mimic the action it just gave you quickly, and and it sharpens. It's also used to repair your tools, which are used on the overworld map to gather resources and open up paths. You can chop wood, you can destroy ore piles to open up access and find little hidden bits on the map. There's a lot going on, but it also provides you the means to scale back the repetitive and tedious aspects of it as you go. It wants you to experience them, but it doesn't want to make you feel mired in them. And I really like that. It's charming. It's fun. Uh, there's a little mystery to it. I'm looking forward to playing more of it. I've I've just reached the point where the main quest of the game has has been unveiled, and you know it's kind of one of those go visit all of the communities and get them on your side kinds of things. And uh, I'm digging the hell out of it. It is really really cool. I uh, I would I would check it out. Um, while the iron's hot. That sounds pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Another thing I've been playing around with this week that I want to talk about a little bit, uh, and I'm not going to go into into huge depth, but um, I've got a like 25 minute video about this that's up on YouTube at the moment. Uh, I've had a chance to play around in some some proper depth with the PlayStation Access controller, which uh, accessibility controller for PS5. Got to go hands on with it for a little while back in September and. I'll start with talking about like how I felt about it when I first went hands-on with it in September for a little bit of context, which is that at the time, my impression of this this device was that it is a really interesting, useful tool if it's a good fit for you, but there are needless limitations that prevent this being for more people. Whereas if you look at something like the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which basically just has a couple of buttons and a d-pad and is largely designed to be a customizable hub for different inputs the xbox adaptive controller for example has 20 little ports around the edge of it so that every single xbox button could be mapped to an external device somewhere you can fully customize that layout but out of the box it's not particularly a standalone controller you you know it doesn't come with an analog stick you can't play modern 3d games just with an xbox adaptive controller by comparison, the PlayStation Access controller has only four external ports. You can use up to two of them at once for a total of eight, but that number of ports is very limited, and it means that if this device's form factor isn't useful to you out of the box, there's not as much you can do to customize it. And a lot of the conversations I had at that preview event with people who'd, who'd worked on it, people from PlayStation, I tried to be like, is there any reason you didn't have more ports on this thing? I'm trying to understand what the positive of that choice is. And it really felt like the answer I was getting was, well, we think we've designed a controller where you're not going to need more ports. It felt like hubris. It felt like a degree of arrogance that... They thought they'd created such a good accessibility controller that you wouldn't need to customize it more than a little bit. Now, having had one uh, or a pair of them uh, for a couple of weeks now, a lot of those thoughts remain. I, I want to get more broadly into like some of the positives I think about it before I, I sort of come back to this, but I, I, I will sort of preface by saying a lot of those criticisms will hold true. In my own use case, I genuinely quite like this device. I think that it is something that I I definitely have a place in my gaming life for, that I appreciate exists. Uh, we've talked about it before. It has a sort of big circular button in the middle and a smaller set of circular buttons around the edge and a joystick to one side. And a couple of things of note, when I was previewing this a couple of months ago, I kept assuming I would need to use two of these to play modern 3D games because there's only one analog stick. And this is experience is going to vary based on game and, and personal experience, but I did find it was surprisingly possible to play a lot of 3D games that use dual analog with just one of these. Uh, there is a button you can use to swap between profiles at any any time. It's very quick to do. What I found for a lot of games was set one profile where the analog stick is the left analog, one profile where it's the right analog, press that button to 
quickly move the camera, press that button again, I'm moving around again. A lot of games, like, you can make that work. Particularly, like, a game I was playing a lot of with just one of these was Lies of P, which is a game where you can click the analog stick to center the camera behind you, and there is a certain degree of automation of camera movement anyway, and I didn't need to move my camera often, and as such, that worked really well with one of these. I also found that, like, there is space for, I think, 10 buttons on this, which is about half of a DualSense controller. And again, I had assumed I would need two of these for a lot more games than I did. If you can boil a game's, like, core most common functions down to about half of the buttons on a controller, which, weirdly, surprisingly good number of games you can do that with, this is a really nice way of, like, condensing those controls in a very customizable layout. I personally really like this device while recognizing that it has really big flaws. The button resistance on the buttons on this, like, they're, they, they're a bit clicky, they need a bit of a push on them. If you can't deal well with that level of resistance, there's not enough external ports to, you know, use external buttons exclusively. There's some really nice software level features for remapping this thing that for no real reason aren't available to DualSense players. Good examples of this, with the access controller, you can do button mapping on a system level to go, when I press this button, can you toggle holding it on and off? That's a great accessibility feature that there's no reason they couldn't be offering to DualSense players to have that same sort of button mapping option. Nope, it's exclusive to the, the access controller. Uh, you can map two buttons to one press, uh, have a little two-button macro. That's exclusive to the access controller. You're not allowed to do that with the DualSense. And it speaks to this sort of rigid thinking of how PlayStation pictures this controller. And to go back to something that was said to me by one of the people who worked on this from PlayStation back at the preview event, I was asking about specifics like this. One, one of the things you can do with the access controller is place it any direction around and change, like, which direction is up on the analog stick based on how I've oriented this controller. And I asked them, will you bring that functionality to DualSense? So if someone needs to hold a DualSense upside down, they can set, this is up for me. And the response I got was, no, because there's one way to hold a DualSense. And they held it like you would imagine a typical person holding it. Like, their response to, this is a really good feature, can you make it available here as well, was, well, you don't need to, there's only one way people hold the non-accessibility controller. This attitude feels like it permeates a lot of this thing's design. In terms of that lack of ports, one thing this controller isn't good for is games that are D-pad heavy, because it's a circle. There's no intuitive place to put the four D-pad directions that feels like it makes sense, at least for me, because you have to put them around the edges of a circle, not one at the top, one at the bottom, one to either side. I looked into external D-pads to be like, can I just plug a D-pad separately into this thing? An external D-pad takes up four inputs because it's four different signals it's sending. That's all of the input ports gone just for adding a D-pad. You can't add anything else. And like that, that degree of limitation, like it, 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 it's once you have one of these and start thinking about use cases that you realize quite how quickly four ports vanishes and how little that is to offer. And I largely maintain what I said when I previewed this thing a couple of months ago, which is if this had released with 20 3.5mm ports on it, if this, if just like the outer, like the lower edge of this thing all the way around was just additional input ports, this would have been very, very much an easier recommendation than the Xbox Adaptive Controller. We'd probably be in a situation where I would be saying, this is the better accessibility controller because it works as a standalone thing out of the box, but also allows that degree of customizability. Without that, I have to suggest two very different propositions and say, for a specific player, which of these is more useful to you? The ability to really go wild customizing this to the nth degree, or the ability to have something that you just get out and it's set up and there's no cables to think about and it, it just works. And for me, that, that aspect has been really nice. It's nice to have an accessibility controller that I can use without having to think about the hurdle of I'm going to have to either set this up and plug all the things into it, or if I left the things plugged into it, have they gotten tangled? Am I going to have to untangle a bunch of wires? That it's just a self-contained thing is really nice, but I know that I'm in a very limited range of people for whom this is 
the right device. And it feels like just adding more ports to it would have made it so easy for PlayStation to be right now in the position of we have maybe the best accessibility controller available on console. So yeah, that's that's the PlayStation Access controller. It is a thing that I can see myself using quite a lot, despite the fact that it really feels like it was designed with a we've got an idea and that's the correct idea mindset. What about you, Steph? What have you been playing this week? I'll lead off with Gangs of Sherwood because I want to talk so little about it that I will use it to transition into talking about finishing watching Twin Peaks, which I know people were eager to see um, me talk about that. Uh, and specifically, me and Conrad talk about that. <laughs> um, for some reason, people thought we might contend a little. Well, on it. I can't imagine. Yeah, so I have now watched all of Twin Peaks. I have The Secret History of Twin Peaks on its way to me, the book. Oh. Uh, just because I got that into Twin Peaks. Yeah. Now. <laughs> last time, last week, I watched all of the first two seasons, the original proper run. <laughs> Thanks to yourself, Conrad, I watched Firewalk with me, which I respect. You respect? Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't altogether like consistently enjoy, but respect. Well, I think that it is a it's a hard film to consistently enjoy. Like, it's pretty brutal um, yes. and unflinching, and so there's definitely I think going to be some uncomfortable points for anybody viewing it for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely mm. got um, like a lot of uncomfies, but yeah, I really do admire that it didn't give people the exact Twin Peaks that they expected. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it almost comes across like, yeah, it's all lighthearted and coffee. That's the shit you remember, but this is what's lying underneath it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. like, this is what it's actually about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's interesting. I have also watched all of season three. The Return. The Return. Now, I asked Conrad this question... <laughs> Did Tim and Eric write it? Because a lot of it feels like a Tim and Eric sketch in terms of, I hesitate to use the word special <laughs> effect, um, the the various animations, uh, <laughs> some of the, the scenes, like the, the scene between Andy and Lisa and uh, Deputy Hawk. Mm-hmm. Where they're talking about the bunny, whether the mm-hmm. bunny is significant. It's not about the bunny. That's Tim and Eric level delivery acting scripting. <laughs> but it also feels like it, it does. It feels very Twin Peaks that moment. Those characters being who they are in that moment. I mean, it's not. It wasn't dragged out to the same extreme as it was necessarily in the original series. But that vibe was always there. Um, but I do think that Lynch, uh, was off the leash pretty much entirely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Contextually, I think there's some differences cause in, in the first two seasons, there were like some long establishing shots. There was a lot of time spent lingering on things that didn't need lingering on, mm-hmm. but it still mm. moved at a pace that I still remained invested. Right. The way the establishing shots feel, in particular two establishing shots, one of which is Dr. Jacoby painting the shovels. Mm. The other is of someone sweeping up some leaves, I guess they are, in the roadhouse. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a technique that D-grade horror films do, where they will show something mundane happening to pad out their 70-minute long horror film. Mm-hmm. I there is one um I think it's Crazy Fat Ethel too. Uh there is a scene where you watch 15 minutes of a of a woman opening individual cans of dog food and putting the food in a bowl and opening <laughs> another and it just goes on and on and on. And that's what it felt like in the return. Mm-hmm. It felt like things I have eviscerated cuz those scenes to me are the difference between like a an entertaining bad film and just a bad film that you watch bored and like uninterested. 
where you get really to the far back end of Amazon Prime's horror selection. <laughs> when you go too far and it's the shit people filmed on their camcorders. And yet lovingly lit, like perfectly <laughs> yeah. staged oh, yeah. and framed. Like it's it has all of the hallmarks of a talented, capable director able to paint the scene and this is the scene that they painted which is fascinating to me in yes. a lot of ways yes agreed some of it comes under the thing i've always criticized which is if you recognize something in media is bad and you just replicate the bad thing to make a point you're worse than the original bad thing because you did it on purpose you were just as boring and just as shit but here's my counterpoint to that I would argue that it is entirely likely that David Lynch doesn't think that this is necessarily bad. Mm. This is a man who has been involved in transcendental meditation for like 40 years. <laughs> I I am not convinced that he thinks it's bad, nor am I necessarily convinced that it is inherently a bad technique. I don't know that it works in this or could necessarily point to an instance where it worked effectively off the top of my head. But I do think that there is certainly a possibility to explore that that, that kind of filmmaking and, and have it be interesting or uh, beneficial to a, a plot or narrative. It depends what it's done for. Right. Mm. And it, to me, it's about the length. I think you can have a section of nothing. An example I'd give. And it doesn't go on anywhere near as long as any of this, which, again, I still think is part of it because pacing is one of the things I talk about in game reviews a lot. Pacing mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is probably the thing I focus on the most. Mm -hmm. um, but mm. the example I use of, of like a good long section of Nothing Happening is The Exorcist 3, which is a great film that is saddled with the name The Exorcist. It had an exorcism thrown in at the end. But otherwise, nothing to do with it, and a legit good film. It's got Brad DeRiff in it, so so you already know that there's going to be some entertainment, but he plays this, uh, the Gemini killer, who is in jail, but the murders seem to still be happening. Like, But anyway, there's this scene in a hospital, this nurse walks down this corridor and back again, and that's it. Mm. And it goes on for quite a while in silence. And then she gets all the way back to the end of the corridor, turns right, walks around the corner. Then from the other corner, something else walks from the other side, chasing her. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember if, if it was that or someone was on the ceiling. But either way, something fucking like, scary as fuck happened. And The Exorcist 3 did it right. They didn't stay so long that you fell asleep, but just long enough that you calmed down and then suddenly bang. So it has been used effectively, but there is a particular bad film below the entertaining B-movies. For sure. For sure. None yeah. of which are famous enough for me to mention because, like, I could mention Freak, which was a DVD that my mum got me from a clothing shop. <laughs> <laughs> they were just flogging these one pound DVDs and they were terrible. But yeah. All of that is to say episode eight of Twin Peaks The Return is possibly the single worst episode of any TV I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and I know for a lot of people it was like, oh, wow, that was such a deep episode. Wow, that, that said so much. But I don't need to sit there for like five full minutes slowly zooming in on a mushroom cloud. I have never fast forwarded through a, an episode of TV so much because it was nothing <laughs> but long shots of nothing. And the the few islands of interesting shit was pretty cool. But I think that speaks volumes about, for me, that series' big, biggest problem. It didn't need to be 18 episodes long. It could have been half that. Like, I like the Dougie stuff, but it went on too long. I think that there is, and, and this has been sort of my perspective on the return, I think there's an element of Lynch toying with the audience yes he knows what they're there for he knows they want cooper he knows they want the resolution of the bob storyline and all of that 
and he has resisted giving them that for 25 years. Yeah, and I, I, I think on that note, like, watching this releasing weekly as it was, mm-hmm. I think really added to that amount of the audience is being fucked with a little. Yeah. For sure. In a way that I don't know if is conveyed the same in binging it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably true. There is a sort of uh, event element to it. Much like the way Twin Peaks originally was sort of appointment mm. viewing for people who were watching it in through that first season and into the second. That, you know... This was the water cooler show. Everybody tuned in the night before so that they could talk about it. They managed to do that, which is pretty impressive these days. Um, you know, you you get your shows that that do your Game of Thrones and whatnot, but to see Twin Peaks come back and so ably uh, enrapture uh, and and infuriate people throughout the course of the run was really something to witness. I don't disagree that it is very, very slow, and um, I like and appreciate that. I would have been happy with Dougie the whole way through. I I just love Dougie so much, and I I think that the the Dougie Jones storyline is so weirdly heartwarming. I mean, we can get into metaphor and themes and 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 all of that. I I think that the Dougie storyline is is saying something about wholesomeness in entertainment. I think the whole show is, at least the, in the return, it feels like a commentary on what has changed in media in the time since Twin Peaks aired. And to an, to a certain extent, why Twin Peaks doesn't work now in the landscape of how just procedural dramas have changed over the course of the last 30 years. It's a very, very interesting piece of, of work. I'm not surprised that you had difficulty with it. Yeah, and I, I want to stress... I had difficulty with it. Right. I had hmm. difficulty like with my patience for it, but that does not mean I didn't get something out of it. Right. And I think that's like I watched it all. After episode 8, I almost didn't want to pick it up again. But I did stick through it because it still is interesting, you know? Like it's fascinating to watch. And there were elements that I was genuinely entertained by. I love Dr. Jacoby mm-hmm. as, as an online, like, political ranter. Well, you, you said to me, you suggested a spin-off show uh, <laughs> in, in conversation <laughs> with me. I want a Dr. Amp show. I just want Dr. Amp. That would Amp. be cool. <laughs> um, yeah, the scene I referenced was I, I, I'd watch an entire show about Jerry Horn tripping his nuts off in mm-hmm. the forest. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it was good to see him, because I love that actor. Yeah. Because he played, like, one of my best favorite movie villains, Luther, in uh, The Warriors. And I really enjoy him. Like, I loved him as Jerry Horn in the original as well. I liked Ben Horn a lot in this. Ben Horn was great. I've always liked Ben. Like, yeah. as a... as a, He's not a nice or pleasant at all character, at least for the first one and a half seasons. But as a performance, he's just one of those guys, like, when he's on screen, I'm watching. Like, I'm mm-hmm. wide open watching because, like, it is a just a delectable performance. So I really like that. So it was good to see. Uh, and it was it was interesting to see the conclusion that he did sort of, like, have a proper change of heart uh, in a lot of ways. So that was nice. I liked Mr. C. He was, again, not, like, utterly vile character. One I was looking forward to seeing get like his comeuppance in the same way that like Bob is a great villain. Mm-hmm. Just overall, he's the kind of villain like, because normally I find villains very fascinating characters and end up wanting to like learn about them and being like not to the point where they're over explained, but I like picking yeah. up lore and stuff about them. Bob is a villain that I don't I don't want to know about him. I just want him gone, mm-hmm. and I mean that as a compliment. He's fucking disgusting, and I don't care about like who he is or what he wants. He, I just want him 
destroyed. And that's great. Like, he really is just a one of the worst characters in terms of that. And one of the things that works so well about him then in the context of all of the other weirdness is that it's it's okay. It's okay that you just want him gone because the other aspects of the lore surrounding him are still fascinating. Absolutely. You still kind of want to dig into Garmin Bogia and and all of that stuff. Yeah. But you don't have to do it hinged to appreciating this horrid monster for which there is no redemption Mm. yeah i don't know what to make of bob's actual sort of final part of of the (laughs) show um but it is what it it is i love it it. is what it is (laughs) i like it because it feels in a way denial of satisfaction which i think is a is a running theme throughout it's a very running theme throughout Mm -hmm. i don't think it would have killed him to at least have had a bit of a standoff with the two coops like, have some payoff. If you do what that did and have everything be a letdown or a subversion of a satisfying payoff or what have you, it's hard to stay invested. It's like, I've seen it once. You've done the whole unsatisfying conclusion thing. Well done. I get that. You don't have to do it again. Point made. Because <laughs> otherwise you end up with the Black Company books, which i have I used to love reading them, used to hate finishing them because they'd build up all these characters and they every single one would have an unsatisfying conclusion. They'd build up all these big, like, scary wizards and they'd all go down like bitches. And the first few times, I think it's clever, but it keeps doing it and then I get bored. There is a... and, and I, you know, you, you can find it if you want to. But there is a multi-hour analysis yeah. of Twin Peaks that you can you can watch, and um, one of the points that is sort of central to their theory on the show as a whole is that um, it's addressing the idea of closure in mm. our drama that we are hungry for it and episodic criminal investigative dramas all sort of neatly wrap up at the end of every episode and the victim is ultimately forgotten in favor of a new victim the next week and so this Mm. theory sort of posits that that's one of the main things that twin peaks is trying to address it's trying to show the impact on the community surrounding uh, people to this death it's trying to keep that person alive past death and viewed through that context that idea that closure on the story of laura palmer is the thing that leads to all of the evil that exists in the return is a very compelling idea i don't know i'm if i'm 100 percent invested in it but it does map on pretty neatly mm. to how all of the content produced, all of the media around Twin Peaks sort of travels. So it's very interesting, and there's a lot to think about, and a lot of a, a lot of meat on that Twin Peaks bone for sure. There is, there is. Like I won't, I certainly can't contest that. I liked the experiment concept as well. the The black and white, mm. lumpy headed demon thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the bit where the face come off. And said, so, "Do you really want to fuck <laughs> with this?" Mm-hmm. After just showing the most, like that utter gibberish behind her face. Yeah. So I'm really glad I watched it all. I'm really glad I watched it all. That third series is. I don't know if I'll ever watch it again. I can yeah. see myself watching the original two seasons again. Maybe Firewalk with me one more time. Maybe. But I am. It's been on my mind like constantly. All of it as a as a complete sort of work. To the point where, like I say, I got the the secret history book coming. I want to get the secret diary of Laura Palmer as well at some point. Give that a read. So yes, uh, in conclusion, <laughs> Gangs of Sherwood is fucking awful. <laughs> uh, That'll be fun for people reading the timestamps. So yeah, anyone else got any other games they want to talk about this week? I'm good. Uh, I do have one more. 
Okay. Um, yeah. I'll go through it quickly because I have just done a bunch of running my mouth. Um, but Pinball M, which I hadn't, I hadn't heard of this, but someone on the uh, Stephanie Sterling's Trash Palace Discord pointed out that the Zen Pinball folks were bringing out a new pinball game, and it had a The Thing pinball table. And as someone who is well known for absolutely loving John Carpenter's The Thing, and someone who is... Uh, an equally well-known pinball aficionado um, who really like still regularly goes back to Zen Pinball 3. That had my attention. Um, got it last week. Today, the thing pinball table finally clicked with me a bit because I've been so fucking disappointed by it because sometimes Zen Pinball has a table that just seems like really like designed to send the ball down the middle of the the flippers mm. and hit the the gutter drain way too much and the thing is like that but i did sort of today i i kind of i've gotten used to some of its fucking tricks like where it tries to send the ball save uh flip right down the middle so i have gotten a bit better with it i've been so like they've started doing pinball m is Three to download and only has one pinball table on it, uh, which is Wrath mm. of the Elder Gods, which it's something Cthulhu-ish, and I don't know if... I'm guessing it's based on a game or something. But yeah, it's a very cthulhu thing. And then you buy the other tables, and I don't like that. I did get them because, I guess, getting them all in the bundle and mounted to what they'd charge if they were all together in a game. But Pinball games turning modular, like, over time, that is just going to fucking take the piss with the amount they sell. Um, it's why I never got into Dead by Daylight, because at this point, I'm overwhelmed by the sheer amount of DLC for it. There is a Dead by Daylight pinball table in Pinball M. So you've got The Thing, you've got Chucky slash Child's Play, Wrath of the Old Gods, Dead by Daylight, and these are all horror-themed. It's Pinball M, mm-hmm. and it's presented very spooky. With like sinister music and and horror themes, and a Duke Nukem table. <laughs> <laughs> Just I guess it's on the M rated theme, but everything else is horror theme. Yeah, the theme. I mean, even in the product description, the theme is horror. Like that's yeah. how they are positioning this. That is a strange, strange choice. Now the Elder Gods table, I think, was in a previous like pinball fx zen pinball really oh, it might have been and so this is a director's cut that has been included as the free game in pinball uh, m all of the tables are i feel like they could have been more than they are like the thing pinball table i found a bit disappointing like in terms of design as well because if you look at some of the previous zen pinball tables like the alien isolation one which has ripley on the table animated, going through vents to appear at different points, and then a big fuck-off xenomorph will, like, regularly appear and stomp about like it does in Alien Isolation. And on the thing, you've only got MacReady as a character model just stood there, and then nothing else thingish, except for, as far as I can tell, it's just one of the um, minigames you can activate makes the dog thing appear, but the other encounters with the thing seem to be, like, the little cardboard cutout approximations that pop up in the thing or just flashing lanes to hit and stuff and i just feel like i want a thing table to be a little fleshier than this they focused entirely on the fact that it's like in the snow so it's very snowy and there's some blood splashed about but like why isn't there a big mutating thing like wobbling about on this table all the time that is a shame it's it's a fun enough table once you get used to it uh the chucky one has a bit more going on i like that it's got a little spinny axe or one of the, the little doors that you can put the ball under. And it's got Chucky on it. And again, just one character model on it that doesn't do very much except for one of the um, mini games. But out of all the tables, it's probably the best one, just in terms of design and, and playability. The Duke Nukem one is fine. I do like that it's got a video mode in which uh, you play an FPS where you use the flipper buttons to uh, look left and right, and then the launch button to shoot as enemies pop up, like a little shooting gallery. That's cool. Dead by Daylight one is decent enough. Was there one more? I don't know. Yes, there was. Uh, But one thing I 
like about it is the campaign section of each table uh, where you have to play the table under certain conditions like you can only fl- use the flippers a certain amount of times or the game will stop once the ball has traveled around for a cumulative amount of distance and every time you f- complete one of those a new prop appears next to the pinball table model so every time you go to one of your pinball tables you're looking at it in this sort of corner of a room that becomes more and more thematic to the table that you're playing such as like unlocking the dog thing burning uh right next to the the table on the floor um it's a really nice little gimmick and you're rated on completion one to three skulls out of three um in place of star ratings and the higher grade you get you get a better version of the prop so that's cute other than that i have played all those tables enough now and i feel like i'd have rather them not do the dlc thing because i think it just lets them give less for more and i think if they sold it for 20 bucks and it had those tables and like one or two more i think it'd be better but otherwise it's it's not bad. I have been enjoying it, but it's not quite as cool as I hoped it would be. I want a thing pinball table to be a lot more flavorful than that. But there you go. Yeah. yeah. So with that, I've got a couple other things, but I'll leave them till next week. Should we rattle through a couple of bits of news and then do a wrap up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can get through some of these pretty quick. Uh, we've got another segment of everyone's It Sure Happens Every Week show embraces confirming more layoffs. Christ. This time, they are at New World Interactive, the developer of Insurgency. Um, the studio hasn't been shut down. We got that confirmation from Saber Interactive, but uh, uh, the studio is, going, uh, is, is being affected by Embrace's comprehensive restructuring program, and... Uh, it isn't sounding like many people are gonna be left. Saber Interactive is trying to like move people from that studio to other existing roles within other studios they own, but yeah, Embracer has basically just like completely demolished this studio, which is not great. Not surprising. This is just gonna be the story that keeps on happening for a bit. We got other layoff stories as well. EA has confirmed uh, a bunch of layoffs at Codemasters. It is unclear how many people have uh, are uh, being being let go at the moment. EA's statement to IGN was very, very. We're doing our best, and we don't want to. We don't want to do anything bad. Let Let me read from a quote from the, from, from IGN. At times, the, what they're doing currently, which is trying to make good games requires the company to make small-scale organisational changes that align with our teams and resources to meet evolving business needs and priorities. It's one of those fucking statements. It's unclear how many people, but a bunch of people from Codemasters have been on social media going, hey, um, I'm looking for new work. EA did have one bit of positive news this week, um, and this is a continuation of something they've been doing for a while. EA has put out some accessibility-related game development software completely open source for anyone to access and use in their projects. That is positive. Um, uh, In particular, there is a program called Iris that they developed, which is for automating detection of frames that could be photosensitivity triggers, and basically creating like an automated layer so that by the time you bring photosensitive consultants in to check the thing you're making less risk to them being, you know, coming across something that sets them off, but also catching potential issues early so that they don't, you know, get baked into the project. Good that that's being made open source. Um, It's not the first time they've made accessibility software open source, and that is a positive, as rarely as we have positives to say about EA. And the last one, we've got a, we've got a, we've got a silly story to end up on today. And Steph, I know you've seen, uh, seen this one. There's Yorkshire tea controllers. Yorkshire tea. 
Yorkshire tea, as the uh, first ever Spectrum crowd chanted when we brought out a giant bag of uh, Yorkshire tea in the Tea Party Deathmatch that we had between Gentleman Jim and Axel Strife. And then because Yorkshire tea was so over, we asked if we could have their official blessing and association to name our tournament cup the Yorkshire Tea Cup. And they (laughs) said no. They said, we can't officially do it because we've got a thing going on with the cricket. And on that note, would you kindly not call it the Yorkshire Tea Cup <laughs> at all? So fuck them and their fucking game controller. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to spend twice the price of a usual game controller to have a game controller with corporate branding on yeah. it. Yeah. Because this isn't just the price of a game controller. This is fucking £150. To have it reskinned with Yorkshire tea. One hundred and fifty pound. Yeah, for a regular Xbox One or uh, Xbox Series or uh, PS Five controller. They better fucking make a cup of tea for that much money. I don't know if you've looked at the images of these controllers. One of them's considerably less aesthetically uh, okay than the other. The PS5 one, you know, not the worst looking piece of branded tat I've ever seen. Yeah. They put the Yorkshire tea logo in red on the little touchpad and they put like the rolling Yorkshire hills on the sides. The Xbox one, it's not like they've done a neat diagonal line down the middle. It feels like the Yorkshire tea red logo is just like kind of crawling across the controller, like undecided how much of the controller it wants to be. So that's a 150 yes, uh... quid to own your own corporate branding. They even joked about it. Yorkshire Tea, like looking at the story, Yorkshire Tea writes that there's even a button that boils your kettle. Not really. It's 150 <laughs> quid. It better boil the kettle. Bastards. It doesn't boil your tea. It does come in a box that has a Yorkshire Tea logo on it and it's a Yorkshire Tea controller. <laughs> I'm going to read Yorkshire Tea's summary of this. Oh, yeah, please do. Picture the scene. You're facing down a bus with three heads and a hammer as big as a truck. Armed with nothing but a rusty sword you looted from a guard. Gulping, you look down at the controller in your hands, wondering if victory is even possible. And you see it. The reassuring branding of your favourite tea. Yes, you (laughs) say to yourself, I can do this. You begin the fight and are immediately one-shotted. You're clearly way too low level for this area. On behalf of Yorkshire Tea, we would like to apologise for this and any other in-game mishaps caused by the powerful feeling of self-belief our controller will fill you with. You know what? Look, I started reading I d- that sarcastically, but the final paragraph, I'm like, fair play. You, you know what? That's the thing. Like, I don't hate. Like, Dave, I don't hate their attempt no, at, at, at leaning into it. They're, it's a bit of corporate bullshit, but like, they had fun with yeah. it. Not worth 150 quid though. Not at all. No, it's... You are paying, what, 80 quid to paint the Yorkshire Tea logo onto it. Yeah. Like, they're charging you more than the controller's price to paint the Yorkshire Tea branding onto the controller. Ah. Uh, there we go. We did it. We we got through them. We've we done it. Fuck yeah. Um, yeah. So there we go. Done it for another week. Um... Oh, I was going to say near the beginning, but I would also just like to um, just say hooray for me being in the QWI at last. Uh, Three years. It took three years, but I'm in the Queer Wrestlers Index, uh, which um, lists the 200 best queer wrestlers in the world. Um, And I made it. Number 136, which for a debut ain't bad considering i didn't think i was going to be on it um that's one thing that happened but laura you make a lot of things happen and people can find out about them i I do do that and people can do that they can do it at laura k buzz pretty much everywhere there you go smooth into that uh yeah laura k buzz on all of the social medias uh patreon that's what pays the bills if you, you could chuck as little as a dollar a month over there it means i can keep making all the things i make um You can check out the audiobook version of Gender Euphoria. That's out now. That's eight hours of just me reading positive trans stories at you. That's fun. Uh, Just Laura K. Buzz. You'll find all the things. Maybe go check out the 25 minute long uh, PlayStation Access controller review. I put a lot of work into that. Hope people check it out. What about you, Conrad? Where are you on the internet? 
Oh, you can find me at Conrad Zimmerman on Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky. You can hang out with me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash thatconradzimmerman. You can buy anti-capitalist propaganda and Jimquisition merchandise, including the very fine Poundin' It t-shirt at mercenarycreative.com. And everything I do online gets supported through Patreon at patreon.com slash fistshark. And you know who else has a Patreon? Who? James Stephanie Sterling. That's true. Yeah, patreon.com slash jimquisition. Uh, that supports that. Um, once again, uh, on December 17th, uh, in, on Saturday in Blackpool we will be doing Spectrum Wrestling's Happy Return show uh, where you can watch myself and Priscilla uh, destroy two Tory twats uh, the landed gentry Xeonox and Benji uh, who will be familiar to possibly Jimquisition viewers as well because I've shown off that, that like those Tories many times um, so yes uh, is there anything else? I don't think so I guess just bye. 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 Bye.